Central Church, living the gospel of Jesus Christ, being God's love with our neighbors in all places. Worship at Central is a time to be with God. A time to celebrate with brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. A time to celebrate the Word. To celebrate in song. To celebrate in praise. Central Church, across from the Cider Mill in Endicott, serving around the world. Good morning, Central Church. On this cold but beautiful day, how are you doing? Making it, making it through winter all right? Raise your hands if you're done with winter. Yeah. I can't do anything about it. I'm sorry. I'm in sales, not management. It is a good and joyful thing to be together in worship today, to sing, to praise, to nurture, to celebrate, to worship God together. May the Holy Spirit fill this time. May the Holy Spirit fill our hearts that all that we do here in this time together may glorify God. Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship on this beautiful Sunday morning. If you're keeping score, this is the fourth Sunday after the Epiphany. If you might be viewing us on television, we thank you for your participation, and we hope that both you and we will feel the Spirit of God moving in our hearts this day. Here in the sanctuary, if you might be a first-time visitor, we have some literature that we'd like to offer. And so we ask it, if you are a visitor, if you would please raise your hand. Our ushers will then locate you and present you with that literature. Also, we'd like to ask everyone to please sign one of the friendship pads. It's usually on the center aisle. Sign it, pass it along, and then pass it on back so that everyone can know the names of the folks sharing a pew together this morning. We move now to a time of announcements. And here at Central, the the youth groups are really quite active and uh, always have activities going on that they'd like us to be uh, aware of. So we're going to have, uh, first, the confirmation class has a special presentation, and then the uh, seniors have another special presentation. Good morning, Central Church. My name is John Music. I'm one of the instructors for this wonderful confirmation class. Today's Super Bowl Sunday, last day of football. Michelle's very upset. Today's the last day. <clears throat> so I just I want to take the opportunity to think, when you think today of the Super Bowl, besides the guacamole and the chips and all that kind of good stuff, is the thing about bottles. So I have some root beer and Dylan's favorite soda, Dr. Pepper. And we have boxes in the area of the churches. Last year we rose about $300. We did pretty good. So we are going to, we got a couple of events this year that we'll talk about at some point. But uh, one of them is DC. And um, these folks have, uh, Beatrice and Dylan have a little presentation to give you about our pancake supper. So think of this confirmation class with the bottles. We've been doing this for a while. So um, think of us when you're watching the Super Bowl today. Thanks. Good morning. If you're planning on getting a little taste of Mardi Gras this month, you don't have to go to New Orleans. On Tuesday, February 17th, our confirmation class will be hosting the annual Shrove Tuesday Pancake Supper from 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock p.m. right downstairs in the dining room. You can repurchase your ticket from any of the confirmation youth and in the welcome Central after after today's service and for the next two Sundays. The tickets are six dollars for adults and four dollars for kids tens and y- younger. Younger ages fives are f- are free. So come and join your f- 
friends and family at Central and support your confirmation class with a little Fat Tuesday. Pancakes are, will be repurchased for the upcoming, whatever it says on this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Lenten season, thank you. Good morning, Central Church. Good morning. My name is Morgan Dewey. And I'm Wyatt. And we have an update from the confirmation and senior high classes this morning. You will notice around the church that there are signed up sheets for our Valentine cookie sale. If you sign up today or no later than February 11th, you can purchase literally dozens of frosted sugar cookies in the shapes of hearts. The sale will take place on Sunday, February 15th, after each morning church each morning church service provided you order the cookies ahead of time. Why a cookie sale, you ask? Well, other than the fact that they, they are delicious and a cookie always good, goes good with a companion of a glass full of milk. <laughs> Pardon the shameless pitch for this, these central youth mugs, which are, the, by the way, are still on sale, of course. Actually, the senior high are raising money for an upcoming February trip to Washington, D.C., Febu uh, February 19th. And what are we going to do there? We will be working with several organizations in, DC, in, in the D.C. area to learn about and participate in their ongoing ministries to help lower income and homeless persons. We appreciate your continuing support and hope that you will sign up to purchase Valentine's Day cookies after service today. Sign-up sheets are in the Welcome Center, in Cafe Central, and outside the church office. Oh, and uh, don't forget, mugs are available for $10 to put your milk in, you know, for the cookies. We promise that the cookies will be your best you have, you've had in a long time. The milk will taste just as much better when you drink it out of a Youth Central mug. Those are messages from the youth. Now, a message from the young at heart. <laughs> Wait a minute, I can't get my glasses. Good morning. Good morning. Gracie, did you know that we have to do an extra show next week? Why, yes, George. We're doing a show in front of a live audience next Sunday right here at Central Methodist Church. That's right, Gracie. Only it won't be just our show. I know, George. We'll also have Abbott and Costello and an Agatha Christie mystery starring Hercule Poirot. And that's not all. There'll also be two other short stories as well. That's right, George. I can't wait to perform in front of a live audience. Neither can I. So let's get the message out. Okay, George. It's next Sunday, February 8th, right here at 3 p.m. That's right. There's no admission, but donations will be requested. And there'll be refreshments at intermission. So we hope to see all of you here next week. That's right. You're all in for a real treat. Say goodbye, Gracie. Goodbye, Gracie. <laughs> Just a reminder of some of the ongoing activities that we have also here. Today, at the, as you leave through the exits, you will be presented with the opportunity to pick up uh, greeting cards and mailing labels for uh, sending greetings to central shut-ins or college students or some of our military service personnel who are far away. We ask that you would consider using these materials 
to let these folks know that Central still cares about them, even though we've not seen them in a while. Also, the United Methodist Committee on Relief is requesting our help in providing materials for both health kits and the uh, cleanup kits. There is in the uh, Welcome Center a one sheet explaining the elements that go into these kits. One side is the health kit, the other side is the cleanup kit. There are a lot of items, but many of them are very low price. And what we'd like to ask you to do is if you would pick up one of these sheets and find certain items here that maybe you even have at home or would purchase and bring in, we would encourage you please to do so, and then others will assemble the uh, supplies into the appropriate kits. We would like to ask that all of your uh, donations go into the big drop box that's outside of the church office. Now there are additional details on these events and, and many others uh, in the bulletin this morning. We would ask you to uh, take a moment or two and uh, look for the items that appeal to you. Now, let us call each other to worship using the responsive litany that is printed in this morning's bulletin. Like a whisper that guides us to safety, strong as a shout that bids us to come, gentle as a prayer that eases our worry, like a clear bell that rings out our name, your word comes to us, loving God. It calls us, comforts us, and urges us to seek peace and to pursue it. Word of God, open our hearts to hear you and free our voices to praise you. Let us pray together. Holy One, the light of your truth was designed to be warmth in the chill of our February. But too often we mean bundled in our coldness, huddled against the bitterness of Arctic days and uncertain lives. God, whose loosed fire of your child into the winter of the world, and kindled the spark that would set the heart of humanity ablaze, forgive us. By your word made flesh, erase the habits of our uncaring, overcome our gloom, and teach us the joy of discipleship, that we may fulfill your love and warm the entire world with the fire of your grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please stand as you are able and join in singing our first hymn, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, number 127 in our red hymnal.
remain standing and take a moment to greet those around you sharing your Christian faith. Good morning. Good to be here.
skip children's time because we're not going to make one or two come up all by themselves. So we're going to skip it for this week and save it and it'll be twice as good next week. And prayers for all these, I mean, they really are. They're all really, really sick. So pray for them. Our Old Testament reading today is taken from the book of Deuteronomy. It's found on page 174 in the Old Testament in your pew Bible. Chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, if I hear the voice of the Lord my God anymore or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, they are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. Shall we pray together? Holy One, we thank you that you gather us together to pray together and to sing together and to celebrate together and to support each other together. We thank you for this community of faith where we can do that each week and all the days in between. We come today and every day listening for your word waiting for a nudge, hoping for guidance. It seems easier to do here in church, but we pray that in between times we are here together, we may listen as well. Open our ears to hear you, open our hearts to receive you, Help us to listen for all the words you give us every day. Help us to recognize them when we hear them. Help us to live them out as we go about all the things we do in each day. For your word fills us with hope and purpose. Your word fills us with passion and power to be your people your word inspires us. Your word calms us. Your word steadies us. Your word pulls us forward, always forward. Help us to listen. We prayed this morning for, for those whose names are in our bulletin. We prayed together that you'd be with us. We've prayed together acknowledging that we need you. This morning we also pray together for those we carry with us. Deep in our hearts we carry family, friends, neighbors, people we've heard about in passing. We, we struggle with their situations with them. We know some who are weak, some who are tired, some who are ill. In this season, we know folks who can't seem to get better. And so in this moment, in this space of grace, in this silence of prayer, we speak. 
We speak those names. We speak those concerns to you. You know each prayer before we speak it, but we ask anyway. Lord, in your love, hear our prayers. For we ask each one in the name of the Christ, as we offer to you this prayer of dependence and hope and trust that he first taught to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The second reading this morning is taken from Mark chapter 1, verses 21 to 28 in the mess, from the message. Then they entered Capernaum. When the sab Sabbath arrived, Jesus lost no time in getting to the meeting place. He spent the day there teaching. They were surprised at his teaching, so forthright, so confident, not quibbling and quoting like the religious scholars. Suddenly, while still in the meeting place, he was interrupted by a man who was deeply disturbed and yelling out, What business do you have here with us, Jesus? Nazarene, I know what you're up to. You're the Holy One of God, and you've come to destroy us. Jesus shut him up. Quiet, get out of him. The afflicting spirit threw the man into spasms protesting loudly, loudly and got out. Every there was, everybody there was incredulous, buzzing with curiosity. What's going on here? A new teaching that does what it says. He shuts up defiling demonic spirits and sends them packing. News of this traveled fast and was soon all over Galilee. Who has ever waited to hear or hoped to hear a word from God? Anybody here? We come to church, that's part of the reason, I think, is that we want to hear something from God. We hit struggles in our lives and trials or um, obstacles and we hope to hear a word from God. We want to hear where God will lead us. We want to hear what God will say. We want to learn how to listen. At least I hope that's why you come to church on Sundays. It's not just for the cake and coffee downstairs or the pizza. You know, we live in a culture where it's very hard to tell what's really true. It used to be that you could watch an action movie and assume that the actor or a stunt person was actually doing the thing being done on the screen. It used to be that you could see a photograph of someone and know that it was really him or her, probably standing right where it looks like they're standing. Now you don't know what's real and what's been caused by a gifted computer programmer or what's been photoshopped into the scene. Everybody can photoshop now. So what's really real? I think the same is true with deeper issues, life and faith and spirituality. What's really real? What's really true? Who has the answers? Who has the truth? You know, there are churches on every corner, every one of them with a different message. <laughs> there are televangelists on every channel. 
There are politicians speaking like preachers. When did they get to co-opt this? I don't get that. There are doom and gloom sayers everywhere, each and every one proclaiming that they've got the true word of God and the authority to speak it. Joel Osteen and I preach two radically different interpretations of the gospel. And both of us are utterly convinced that we have listened to and acted upon God's word in our preaching. We are also likewise utterly convinced that the other one is wrong. He is, by the way. <laughs> Religious folks on both sides of any hot-button issue in politics or culture, whether it's war, peace, abortion, homosexuality, global environmental emergency, or economic crisis, every one of them on either side of any story is convinced that they are speaking the inspired truth, probably revealed to them by God. Makes me nervous, to tell you the truth. Most clergy agree that we are presuming a lot by attempting to speak God's word or the word of God to you. I don't know a preacher that doesn't get butterflies every Sunday, and it's not because of the public speaking. Public speaking, you can learn. 25 years ago, every time I had to say something in front of people, I had to script every single word and read it word for word. I still write my sermons. It's not butterflies because of the public speaking. I usually can't eat anything on Sunday morning before church. I'm far too nervous about getting up here and having the audacity to presume that I'm going to speak something from God to y'all. It's terrifying. How do we know what God wants to say? How do we know the true word? How do we decide who has authority? Where does the truth come from? It's an old, old, old question. Moses' people asked him that in the Hebrew Scriptures all the way back to Deuteronomy, what Marie read this morning, as they're trying to figure out how to be the people of God listening to God. And then the answer comes to them in the words of the prophet. If the prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, but the thing does not take place or prove true, then it's not, it's not the word of the Lord. There's the comforting addition. Don't be troubled by that. The converse is true. If it's true, if it takes place or it proves to be true, then you can probably reasonably assume that God has spoken that word. What we're supposed to be looking for is the real word of God. We're not supposed to get sidetracked by something that may look like it or sound like it. It's not easy. It's not easy to do. Sometimes things take a long time to prove right or true. And we're easily fooled by our own wishes or by other people's interests or by other people's manipulations. So sometimes it works maybe, to discern what's false, what's not true. How do we do that? Well, the one who speaks the word of God falsely has an interest in him or herself. He or she requires something in payment for that word that's spoken, whether it's your money. Well, that rules out the televangelist, doesn't it? Or your self-worth or your individuality. The truth is withheld until payment is made. Or the speaking of the word is for the show, or for the attention, or for the shock value, or for the power, or the glory, or maybe for more intangible things like, like the speaker's own salvation. There are so many motivations, some conscious, some deeply subconscious. Many people speak their own interpretations of God's word from from their own psychological hurts or their own angers or their own needs that they carry. There's no way to pin it down, but you know it when you hear it. But there are times when truth is spoken, when God's word is spoken, 
with authority. And it's possible to know it when you hear it. That's what we hear in this story in Mark's gospel this morning. Those who saw Jesus in Capernaum that day knew immediately that they were encountering the truth. They were encountering something of God. They heard Jesus, they saw what he did, and they knew he was it. He speaks with authority, they said. It's in the message, it's um, a new teaching that, that says what it does or does what it says. They know the religion because the scribes have been teaching it for years and the Pharisees have been enforcing its legalisms for years. They've heard the prophets and teachers come and go. Even in Jesus' day, Jesus is not the only wandering teacher in the first century Israel. But here in front of them, in this moment in Capernaum, is one who does more than speak the word. They realize that he is the word. He embodies the word. John would say this in, John, in John's gospel. Um, the author says this in beautiful poetry. He is the word. What he does carries power. What he says gives them a glimpse of the realm of God, what it might look like for the presence of God to be more powerful than any other person or thing or illness or addiction or weakness or power or principality in this world. Somehow, Jesus has moved even beyond the role of a prophet here, speaking the word of God. Somehow, these people see in Jesus, in this moment, the living word of God, spoken in power and with authority. They know it when they hear it. Maybe it's because it has no conditions. It demands nothing, requires nothing, gives everything. Freedom, release, Healing, wholeness, purpose, that's the whole story of the exorcism. Is that the word Jesus speaks releases someone to healing. That's the way to discern the true word of God, to hear the truth. When we encounter something that brings us closer to God for no other purpose than that, then it's God's truth. It's God's word. When we encounter something that helps us to establish a relationship with God and it exists only for that reason, then it's God's. When we hear a word that strikes a chord somewhere deep in our souls and requires nothing more than our response to it, then it's God's truth. It's God's word. When the one who speaks it is concerned only with our relationship with God and bringing God's realm and love to reality, then we can be pretty sure it's God's word. That's what Jesus' teachings are all about. It's his life. It's his purpose. People see in him the living word of God who teaches us about relationship with God for no other reason than to bring God's love to life in us. No smoke, no mirrors, no payment for miracles rendered. You will see in none of the Gospels Jesus saying after he performs a healing, you can make the check payable to. Nowhere does Jesus ask for anything back. Those around him can see the truth. Those who listen with their hearts as well as their ears know what he's saying to be true. Jesus would say it again and again in the Gospels, those who have ears, let them hear. Jesus speaks the word. Jesus is the word. May we have the ears to hear. Thanks be to God. Amen. <clears throat> So we come now to this table, <laughs> this table of life and grace and power, this table of joy and inclusion, 
this table of grace. In the United Methodist tradition, this table is open <laughs> to everyone, even me, even you. This table is open whether we're listening for God or not, whether we're ignoring God or not. How many times do we do that? This table is open to speak a word of love and hope to us. And so the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, Holy One, for you made us. And before us, you made the world we inhabit. And before the world, you made the eternal home in which we have a place. All that is spectacular, all that is plain, have their origin in you. All that is lovely and all who are loving point to you as their fulfillment. And grateful as we are for the world we know and for the universe beyond our understanding, we particularly praise you, whom eternity cannot contain, for coming to earth and entering time in Jesus. For his life, which informs our living. For his compassion, which changes our hearts. For his clear speaking, which contradicts our harmless generalities for his disturbing presence, his innocent suffering, his fearless dying, his rising to life, breathing forgiveness. We praise and worship you and give you our eternal thanks. Here too, our gratitude rises for the promise of the Holy Spirit, who even yet, even now, confronts us with your goodness and attracts us to you. Therefore, we gladly join our voices to the song of the church with its prophets and apostles, with the weak and the willing, with the sinners and the saints, with your people on earth and all the host of heaven, we praise your name and join the unending hymn. Blessed is your Son, Jesus the Christ. And now, lest we believe that our praise alone fulfills your purpose. Bless that soul. We fall silent and remember him who came because words were not enough. Setting our wisdom, our will, our words aside. Emptying our hearts and bearing nothing in our hands. We yearn for the healing, the holding, the accepting, the forgiving, which you alone can offer. What we do here, we do in imitation of what Christ first did. To his followers in every age, Jesus gave an example and a command rooted in an experience he shared with his friends and his disciples. That's a big one. With his friends and his disciples in an upper room in Jerusalem. On the night before he died, and as they were sitting at a meal, Jesus, Jesus took the bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, this, this is my body. It is broken. Take and eat and remember. When the supper was over, he took the cup, and he shared it with them, and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. 
This is sacrifice and love. This is my blood poured out. Take and drink and remember. Always remember. So now we do as Jesus did. We take this bread and this cup, the produce of the earth and the fruit of human labor. In these, Jesus has promised to be present and through these, Christ can make us whole. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Merciful God, send now in kindness your Holy Spirit to bless this bread and this cup and fill them with the fullness of Jesus. And let that same Spirit rest on us, converting us from the patterns of this passing world until we conform to the shape of him whose food we now share. All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. the universe cannot contain is present to us in this bread. The one who calls us by name now meets us in this cup. So take the bread, take the cup, share this meal, and listen for God. In this meal, God comes to us that we might come to God. I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward, or our servers to come forward, not our ushers. They're doing something else. The bread is gluten-free. We take uh, communion today by intinction, that is dipping the bread into the cup before consuming it. As you go into this week and into this world, go and listen. Listen for God's word from other people, from your heart, wherever you may hear it. May you open your ears and may it be true for you. Go and may the peace of Christ go with you. Amen.